everybody. We are the Diva Nuclei Association, <laughs> otherwise known as DNA. DNA. <laughs> I'm Eliza. I'm Camille. And I'm Kriya. And today we're going to be talking to you about phytoplankton and bacterial diversity in the Penobscot Bay. So, why does this matter? Phytoplankton are extremely important in marine ecosystems and in our atmosphere. This is because they provide 50% of the atmosphere's oxygen and are the base of the food chain. Phytoplankton are a smaller category of protists. Protists are single cell eukaryotes. They are also related to microbes. Microbes are bacteria that can be harmful or non harmful. And most of the time, these phytoplankton and microbes are associated, which means that they interact with each other very often. What did we want to learn? We wanted to explore a new branch of science that none of us had really worked with before and we wanted to get a better look into the world of microbiology. So we wanted to look at the changing environments, and we know that in recent years, um, the marine ecosystems have faced um, change in their environmental conditions, such as temperature, salinity, and nutrient levels. And so we could look at the Penobscot Bay estuary, because where the river meets the um, saltwater is the environmental conditions change very quickly over a fairly short gradient. And so we could use this to simulate how phytoplankton and bacterial communities would change with changing environmental conditions. From research that we did, we hypothesized that the diversity and abundance of associated phytoplankton and bacteria will be highest up the bay. This is because the mouth of the bay will have higher salinity levels, depth, and a higher temperature. How did we do this? Uh, first step was going to Maine Maritime Academy to collect uh, some surface and depth samples of uh, microbes and protists using a conductivity, temperature, and depth instrument, also known as a CTD. So here's a zoomed out map of where we were on the Mount Scott Bay. Um, we were based out of Maine Maritime Academy in Castine, and we were collecting samples right at the mouth of the Mount Scott River. Uh, this is a more zoomed in map of where we were, and this map also shows where we collected each part of our data. So the red dot is our first site, and the yellow dot, the second site, and the purple dot is our third site. So this is a map of the methods we took to conduct our experiment. So we started, as we said, at Maine Maritime Academy. Um, and the research vessel of friendship, and you can see the CTD off the back of the boat. And we took um, samples at three different sites, and a surface sample and a depth sample at each site. And with those whole water samples, we ran them through a PVC pipe with a 20 micron filter at the bottom of it. And this was so that we could collect all of the phytoplankton and their associated bacteria that were larger than 20 microns, and flush out all the free-floating bacteria that were smaller than 20 microns. <coughs> And then after we had this concentrated sample, we ran it through a syringe with a 0.2 micron filter paper at the bottom of it so that all of our concentrated samples would be collected on that one filter paper. And we then put this in the doer in liquid nitrogen so that we could, um, it would freeze and we could extract the DNA at a later date. These two graphs show our environmental data. The top one shows salinity and the bottom one shows temperature. These four these measurements were taken at every site at depth and at surface. As you can see, the graphs are very similar, which means that they had a strong correspondence to each other. Uh, the next step in getting our data was going to Bowdoin College and extracting the DNA by using a centrifuge, which is that right there. And what it does is, uses, is it uses centrifugal force to spin the data really quickly to get rid of any unwanted debris and then we would put it into the thermocycler to perform polymer polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So the next step in our methods was to send our uh, data off to Yale, where they would perform a fragment analysis. And so even though we were looking at the same intergenic spacer genetic region across all species, the, the lengths of those genetic regions were going to be different compared to um, or based on what species they came from. And so this fragment analysis was sending our samples through tiny tubes called capillaries, 
where the shortest of those genetic regions would go through quickest, um, and the longest of those genetic regions would go through slowest and go through last. And at the bottom of that capillary was a laser, which would measure the length of those genetic regions, which we could then link back to the specific species. And it also measured the fluorescence, which we could link back to the abundance of the species. And so this is what our data looked like when we um, got it back. And we used the automated ribosomal intergenic spacer analysis method, or ERISA, to link the lengths of the genetic regions back to a species. And so we could select a sample, as uh, shown here, and um, it would give us this peak graph where the um, lengths of the genetic regions are displayed on the x-axis and the abundance of those species are displayed on the y-axis. So each peak that you see there is a different species and depending on how high it is reflects how abundant the species is. So this is a graph on protists that corresponds to our stations and depth and surface area. As you know, every peak represents a different species, and the height of that peak represents the abundance. And all these peaks, these peaks aren't overlapping, which means that the species were very diverse and weren't the same at every station. Uh, this is the same kind of graph, but for microbes, and again, each different peak is a different species. And however high it is, is how abundant. We used these graphs, or similar graphs, and ran them through ADAPT software. ADAPT software was an online software that told us whether microbes were autotrophic or heterotrophic. Autotrophic microbes are microbes that provide food for themselves, and heterotrophic microbes are microbes that rely on other organisms for food. It also told us whether microbes were pathogenic or non-pathogenic. Pathogenic microbes are microbes that harm, and non-pathogenic microbes are microbes that do not harm and can be beneficial to phytoplankton. So using this ADAPT software, we could take the peak um, that, the highest peak that is ranked there from site one surface and run it through the ADAPT software and see that that peak was a Streptococcus thermophilius and that is a non-harmful pathogen um, and it is heterotrophic. So that's just an example of what we could do with that ADAPT software. So we could the diversity of microbes and protists. Microbes were more diverse at the surface. These graphs also showed that um, protists were more abundant at depth. Here we were comparing the salinity to the diversity of protists. And as you can see here, we noticed that a lower salinity resulted in a lower diversity. While um, we can say, though, the same is for the higher salinity, because as you can see, the higher salinity at site one depth does not result in the highest diversity. We also noticed that there was a seemed to be a separate um, water mass at both site one surface and site two surface because they have that. Um, low salinity compared to the rest of our data. Uh, this is the uh, same kind of graph but for temperature and protests. And um, as they're similar to the last graph, a lower temperature uh, resulted in a lower diversity of protests. And again, we see that kind of separate um, mass of water down at site one surface and site two. Uh, in these graphs, we were um, comparing the temperature of, uh, and diversity of microbes, and we actually found that there was no correlation between temperature and microbe diversity. And similarly, when we compared the salinity to the microbe diversity, we found that there was no correlation between that, um, those two. So that was pretty interesting. Um, so, as Kay said, the ADAPT software gave us um, information on whether microbes were pathogenic or not pathogenic. And so we um, compared the diversity of protists to the number of pathogenic microbes in our samples. And we found that um, as the diversity of protists increases, so does the number of pathogens. And for this graph, we had an R squared value of 0.8, which means that there's a strong correlation between these two variables. 
And we can link this um, graph back to the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which states that um, a community is most diverse and stable when the disturbances um, that it's seeing are neither too few nor too great. And so as the number of pathogens increases, even though they might be harmful at first to the protists, it's actually creating a stabler and more diverse community. Another thing that we did to collect some of our data was we collected phytoplankton. And we did that by uh, doing two neptos in the Penobscot Bay. And then we brought that, back that data to our lab and we counted it under a dissecting microscope in a diluted sample with a 20 to 1 ratio. And we then averaged the number of cells in each sample. So in sample, or in site one, uh, we had an average number of cells of about 207.4, and in site two, it was 126.7. So, big difference in each site. <coughs> These were some of the interesting phytoplankton that we found in our count at site one. The phytoplankton on top left is Skeletonema pistatum. The phytoplankton in the middle, star like, is Asteria nuopsis. And the phytoplankton on the top right is Dilium brightwelli. Every single cell, we had to count them to have a fuller image or view of the phytoplankton. Uh, these were some more unique phytoplankton that we found in the second site. Um, the one up here is a eucampia. This one down here is a pseudonentia. And then the one in the far corner is a thalassiosagra. So, in conclusion, we found that our data shows that microbes had high diversity at surface and protists had high diversity at depth. We thought that associated phytoplankton and microbes change and adapt over a very short distance because these communities were so different. We also thought, oh, um, sorry. We also found that ERISA detected much more diverse phytoplankton than what we found in our counts. So uh, we'd like to thank all of the people that made this project and experiment possible including the Maine Maritime Academy for supplying us with um, the CTD and their um, resources to collect our samples. Bowdoin College for letting us use their lab and their equipment. Janet Gannon for helping us go through this process and extracting DNA with us. Yale University for doing our fragment analysis on our data. And of course, Dr. Carrie Whitaker for helping us through this process so much and teaching us. Any questions? You talked about some differences created by disturbance. What kind of disturbance? Was it tidal or the boat moving through the water or what? what For the by disturbance? Um, for the intermediate disturbance hypothesis mm -hmm. that. So um, when we compare the diversity of protists to the number of pathogens, because pathogens are harmful microbes, um, so they can actually be harmful to the protists. So that would that's what we were looking at as the disturbance, which would then affect the diversity of protists. I just want to say that I am so impressed with the way all of you pronounce all of these. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do any of them. And you just talk about them like they're just, you know, casual acquaintances. <laughs> I'm even more impressed with that. Good job. Do you know why um, the surface temperatures are lower than the ones? We, we don't. don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, it was it was really surprising to see that kind of um, at the site one surface and the site two surface that kind of like separate low salinity, low temperature um, water. But we don't know why that is. So. I have a comment. A, a thank you. I I teach science and I teach a lot of marine science stuff, and um, I found that the kids who tend to be most like, there's a weird correlation I see in my small sample size of, um, of students who have um, different ways of learning, 
are excellent, excellent field scientists and may not be have the same strengths in terms of being able to um, carefully write down data or sit in the classroom or something like that. And um, you, you've given me a couple hours of sleep this week to enjoy uh, Caroline and Melissa because I've been, I'm getting observed next week. And I was trying to figure out how kids have to make a, an experiment and have to do a lab report. And I was like, how am I going to accommodate those kids who have dyslexia or dyspraxia that it's so hard for them to write out a full lab report? And that methods map is beautiful. Because if someone, I, I mean, I looked at that. I know what you were doing. And if a 12-year-old kid does that for me, I'll know he won't have to, you know, he won't have to spend hours agonizing over what's hard for him, but he'll still communicate. So thanks for that. There was a question up here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So you're your uh, surface water was lower salinity and colder, is that right? We did, yeah. Um, yeah. That's likely from uh, the rivers this time of year are cold and coming oh, in okay. and feeding the, the estuary. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, next up, I would like to introduce the Muscles Get Cracked of Anna, Sophia, and Melissa.